And joining us now in studio, Jeremy Rifkin, founder and president of the Foundation on Economic Trends and author of The Third Industrial Revolution, How Lateral Power is Transforming Energy, the Economy and the World. Hello again. Nice to see you again. Okay, you write that energy regimes really shape civilizations. How did steam and coal power change society? It changed the spatial orientation dramatically. You know, um, up until the industrial age, we didn't live in huge cities. There were a few exceptions like ancient Rome based on slavery and, and concentrated agriculture. But as soon as we moved to the Industrial Revolution and we used all of that coal and put it together with uh, cheap print material, we could have big urban populations. London was the first city with a million. And then over the period of the 19th century, we saw urbanization all over the world. The 20th century, the second Industrial Revolution, the coming together of centralized electricity and the automobile created the suburban culture. So we could distribute uh, our living habitats in that way. The third industrial revolution is going to create a more distributed society. So it's, it, it changes fundamentally. Communication energy changes the way we live. What do you mean a more distributed society when it comes to the third industrial revolution? Because it allows everyone to use their own green energy locally and regionally. And it means that we can begin to see our part of the biosphere as our responsibility. But it also requires that we share our energy uh, with others in neighboring regions. What's happening with the third industrial revolution, it comes in nodally, like Wi-Fi. Let me explain. When Wi-Fi came in, it was improbable. Everyone kind of sharing their, their frequencies and their garage openers. <laughs> Within 10 years, Wi-Fi went across continents to the ocean edge. The third industrial revolution infrastructure comes in notably like Wi-Fi when a city creates a five-pillar third industrial revolution, renewable energies. Their buildings are converted to power plants to create the energy. They put in hydrogen to store the energy. They put in electricity, internet to share the energy, and they plug it into transport. When a city like Rome, we did the master plan for Rome, my group, when they create a five-pillar node, they're immediately looking around for another node because when Rome has a surplus of green electricity because the sun is shining, they had a lot of good wind for electricity, they want to sell to Munich or to Oslo or to Warsaw. Uh, or when other, say one region of the continent's at night and there's a lot of electricity, they want to sell theirs to another part of the continent that's still daytime. Or if the sun is in one part of the continent during the day, they want to send it to a time zone that's at night. So the third industrial revolution comes in nodally. You have to imagine thousands and thousands of nodes, cities, suburbs, rural areas, creating their own green energy on site, storing in hydrogen, then sharing surpluses across time zones that reach ocean edges. So we're collaborating. We're collaborating, and this moves us to continentalization. The first and second industrial revolution scaled vertically. Elite energies, centralized factories, centralized logistics, transport. It favored national markets, national governments. The third industrial revolution likes to move laterally across continents. It favors continental markets and continental political unions. So I think that's where we're headed. We're going to globalize the world based on continentalization, continental markets, continental political unions. Okay, we're going to talk about continentalization, but I just want to step back because if we're all in our homes uh, generating, collecting, and distributing and collaborating our energy, um, and the centralized utility company is no longer needed, what's the effect going to be on small and medium-sized businesses? This third industrial revolution is power to the people. Sometimes it's called distributed capitalism. It's actually a bit beyond capitalism and socialism as a model. It takes the best of both and it, and it eliminates the worst. In other words, everyone has to be an entrepreneur. Think internet. Everyone on the internet's an entrepreneur, whether they're sharing video, audio, and text. But you're only entrepreneurially successful on the internet to the extent you can collaborate in deep social networks. So the same here when the internet manages energy, it's when hundreds of millions and then eventually billions of people are entrepreneurial. They're literally empowered, but they're sharing their energy and resources across continents. You get the best of capitalism, the entrepreneurial spirit, the best of socialism, and that is solidarity and collaboration me across example. social networks. Uh, well, I think the, the, the best example I could give you here is that uh, in Germany right now, Germany's way ahead. I've been advising Chancellor Merkel since she came in. And uh, what in Pillar 1, they're already 30, uh, 20 percent green electricity already. They're heading to 35 percent green electricity. Pillar 2, Germany has converted a million buildings to power plants in seven years and created 370,000 net jobs collaboratively. Pillar 3, they are testing hydrogen to store the energy and infrastructure all over Germany. 
Pillar 4, they're testing the smart grid, the energy internet, in six regions of Germany right now. And Pillar 5, uh, Daimler uh, and the other car companies are coming out with their fuel cell vehicles in 2014 and laying out fueling stations across Germany. You know, Germany created the second industrial revolution, Daimler-Benz, the internal combustion engine, and then they put in the Autobahn. Watch Germany. They are the most robust industrial economy in the world per capita, and they vie with China as an exporting power. There's only 80 million people. So Germany is the best example I know to date of this new revolution afoot. Okay, but if we have in Germany and elsewhere these growth, as you, as you put it, these small and medium-sized businesses, there's something called the banking industry. <laughs> you might have heard yes. of it. How is that going to be affected? Because well, let me, let, me, let me talk about SMEs. We put a coalition together in Europe of all the small and medium-sized federations because it's 70% of the business of Europe. We put them together with the consumer federations and the cooperatives, the producer and consumer cooperatives, because the third industrial revolution doesn't scale vertically. It scales laterally. So it favors SMEs collectively SMEs. coming together, small and medium-sized okay. enterprises. And it allows them to democratize information, energy, manufacturing, marketing, and logistics. Let me lay out a new economic paradigm for you in two minutes. We've democratized information, very cheap, to send information on the Internet. Now the Internet's democratizing energy. It's going to be just as cheap to generate your own energy and share it. Once the five-pillar infrastructure is in place, we can now democratize manufacturing. It's called 3D printing. There are now hundreds of companies. You can take software, code for a product in a printer, and then direct the molten plastic or the metal to layer by layer. The software shows it how to make the product. The product pops out of the printer. I can print my shoe. It's like magic. Now, this new type of manufacturing that depends on the Internet uses one-tenth of the materials because instead of winnowing down, you're building up the material, so you're not losing any. It uses one-tenth of the energy. And then if you're a small and medium-sized company in Canada and you're producing your own green energy for your little factory, you don't have the cost of fossil fuels on world markets or nuclear power, then you can market your product anywhere in the world on the Internet, like sites like Etsy that brings together thousands of craft producers with millions of consumers. There's no marketing cost. Then if you're a little small and medium-sized enterprise, you're manufacturing locally, you're marketing on the internet with no expense, and then your logistics is your own green transport that you're powering. You don't have to be worried about your regional markets because you can outcompete global centralized top-down companies. That's a third industrial revolution. That is a real revolution. This fundamentally changes the relationship between producer and consumer. Absolutely. It, what happens is they talk, sometimes we talk about it as prosumers, but it completely throws a, a, throws apart, if you will, the idea of sellers and buyers in a traditional market. Now you have to imagine that everybody is potentially a player in their own economic destiny. And what we will see is small and medium-sized enterprises joining together in producer cooperatives to scale this laterally and pool their risks across entire regions and entire continents. Global companies will not disappear. Some of them will. The ones that remain will transform their role from producers to aggregators they will have the reach to aggregate large networks. But increasingly, the manufacturing, the services will be done by hundreds of thousands and then millions of small and medium-sized producers. Well, how will this um, ha have an effect on how we relate and connect to people in general? It seems there will be a fundamental shift. It's a, it, it's a fundamental shift in power, and the best way I can describe this is it's a generational shift. In my generation, we thought power is top-down. So when we hear lateral power, it's an oxymoron. How can you have lateral power side by side, peer to peer? Power always has to be a pyramid. Everyone in the internet generation has no problem because they organize peer to peer. For them, lateral power is power. So this changes the political frame of reference. When a young person talks politics, they don't talk about right, left, who owns the means of production, capitalism versus socialism. That's some historical artifact. Young people on the internet generation on the third industrial revolution generation, when they view an institution and judge it, a government, a political party, a business, or a school, they ask this question politically. Is this institutional behavior centralized, patriarchal, top-down, proprietary and closed, or is this institutional behavior distributed, collaborative, open, transparent, and lateral power? That is a great shift from the idea of power is top-down to lateral side by side. It'll change the sociology and the political frame of reference for the next generation. So our public perception of government 
would need to change them? Yes. Well, we're hearing new terms like liquid democracy. Um, uh, what's happening now, a more collaborative lateral third industrial revolution favors more direct engagement 24-7. The idea of voting for a representative and then you, you don't hear from them for four years and then you vote again, way too passive for a generation that's on Twitter. So now uh, young people are talking about uh, liquid democracy in a Twitter-type governing atmosphere and more and more political movements are emerging uh, at, to personify the cardinal virtues of this third industrial revolution paradigm. The pirate parties that are emerging all over the, year, the world, the Occupy movement, the young green parties, et cetera. Okay, but if you look at the current state of affairs, whether in the U.S. or in Europe, we are still dealing with the left and right politics. It seems, uh, you know, that they're almost stalled, that there's a stagnation and we're increasingly polarized, the public's increasingly polarized. So what does this stagnation then portend for the third industrial revolution? We have, we have very little time to make this jump. I mean, if you really take a look at what our climate models are saying and forecasting, back in 2007, the UN Panel on Climate Change said we have about five, six years, and we've got to transform radically this civilization. We're now at the edge of that time belt. So uh, we don't have much time. We have to make a shift in consciousness. It, this is a decent plan. This five-pillar third industrial revolution isn't rocket science. If there's a plan B, I have no idea what it is. And I have 120 companies, global companies, small and medium-sized associations. We know this plan's workable. But unless we change consciousness as quickly as we have this technology, we can't get there in time. We have to move from geopolitics to biosphere politics quickly. We have to think as a species. We can no longer afford the luxury of thinking in our isolated boxes, ideologically or theologically or based on blood ties. All of those we don't leave by. But we have to understand we live in an indivisible community, and it's the biosphere. The sheath from the stratosphere to the oceans, where the geochemical living processes interact in a very complex system dynamic that allows us to maintain this thing called life, this mysterious adventure in the universe. We have to begin to think as a species. We have to think of our fellow creatures as our evolutionary relatives who have a right to be here. And we have to think of the biosphere as that indivisible community. That means when we organize the next period of history economically, we have to think of that as our frame of reference, spatially. I'm guardedly hopeful. I'm, I'm not naive about this industrial revolution I'm talking about, this third industrial revolution. This is a tough uphill climb. But the only alternative to that is if you go back to the 20th century, and then I think we're doomed. Here's my guarded hope. You have a youngster at home. Here's my guarded hope. I'm seeing 10-year-old kids, 11-year-old kids coming home from school. They're developing biosphere consciousness an empathic approach to the future. They're asking mom and dad, why is the water on when daddy is shaving? Too much water. Ten-year-old kids are saying, where are the, why are we using the TV on, on mode when no one's watching the TV? Why do we have two cars when we can have one car and do car sharing? Or here's the one I like. Where'd the hamburger come from on my plate? Did it come from a central rainforest in Central America? Did they have to destroy the tree canopy to graze the animal on the soil? When they destroyed the trees, what happened to all the animals in that canopy? Did they go extinct? And when there's no more trees there because they're grazing the cow for my hamburger, there's no CO2 sink to absorb climate change. So a farmer 10,000 miles away is getting more floods and droughts and can't feed his kids because of my hamburger. What the kids are learning is everything we do has an ecological footprint that affects the well-being of some other family, some other creature, and some other ecosystem. They're connecting the dots. That is a great shift from the geopolitics of mine versus thine to biosphere politics of our common community. You also argue in your book that the revolution needs to take shape by shifting from focusing on national politics to a more global political sphere. Globalization uh, has its you know, detractors, it has its supporters. What effect is this third industrial revolution going to have on the idea, the ideology of globalization? I think we're going to see a shift from uh, nation states as the primary unit to continental political unions because the third industrial revolution favors continental markets because it likes to spread across continents. But then you have to have continental political unions as networks to manage that commercial activity and that social activity. The EU is the most mature union. If we can do this, we move to the next stage of integration. The Asian Union is now forming quickly, the South American Union. And the wild card here is the North America. Can North America, Canada, and the U.S., can it create a political union and a continental market? NAFTA is not. NAFTA was really based on U.S. interest in preserving our 
oil interests in making sure Canada was there to provide us with all the necessary raw resources. I'm going to be pretty honest about that. But what I've noticed is what's happening in Canada and the U.S. is a de facto continental union is forming under the radar without any discussion in the media. For the last 15 years, the Northeast governors have been in deep partnerships with the Northeast pre premiers of the provinces, the Midwest, and the West Coast. So you're seeing these three groupings of provincial premiers and governors who are working together on energy issues, resource issues, uh, employment issues, and they often have more in common with each other than either have with their central governing bodies in Ottawa or Washington. So what we're beginning to see at the border is this de facto bottom-up kind of a lateral shift to a continental market without the centralized legislation. We may begin to see, as the Third Industrial Revolution rolls out, this porous infrastructure moving across the Canadian-U.S. border and regions and state governments working together, and that can begin to create a narrative for a much broader continental market, similar to the one in Europe and the one that's forming in Asia. I can almost feel people watching this show cringing at the idea of potentially losing uh, some of our own Canadian national identity if we were to go into this continentalization mode. Um, and I think people would say this is going to create strife, not collaboration. So how would the third industrial revolution overcome this? It overcomes it because it relies on everybody having enough empowerment personally and you only can actually make it work if you share. Think internet. In other words, if you're, a, if you're here in a province in Canada and you are creating your own energy and you have a tremendous amount of energy locally on the ground, you are empowered. You can decide to keep it or share it. If you share it across an energy internet uh, with folks on the other side of the border and we do it with you, it allows everyone to be individually empowered, but it also allows us to collaborate and share on an equal basis. So there isn't this idea of the great U.S. dominating small Canadian market. It's based on collaboration and sharing, like the Internet model. And I think for a younger generation that grew up on the Internet, the idea of sharing information, now we say to them, now how about sharing energy, creating a more sustainable continent here in North America, reducing climate change, and hopefully rehealing this planet in the 21st century. That's an agenda that will not inspire fear. It will inspire hope. It will inspire the idea that there can be a future worth looking forward to. And as I talk to young people around North America and around the world, they have a grim outlook on the future because they see us stuck in an old second industrial revolution that's killing the economy and endangering the planet. Now we have to say, here's a new story. This story is going to have to be intergenerational. We want young people across America and the world to join together and use that same uh, lateral power to now begin to create a third industrial revolution for the future. There is the example, of course, of Europe, Jeremy, and you say that's the best example of this idea of continentalization. But look at Europe today. It's imploding economically, it's stratifying mm -hmm. socially, there's a resurgence of, of ethnic nationalism. If this is our only example of this, I mean, what gives you the confidence that it's going to work elsewhere? Well, I spend quite a bit of time. I advise the European Commission, the European Union, develop this plan with the EU. I would say that uh, what's happening in Europe is, a, is what's happening in the world. And again, it gets back to what we were talking about uh, yesterday, and that is that we have a global economic crisis because we are ending the age of fossil fuels. It hit America first, it blew over to Europe, it blew to Asia and around the world. So I'm often amazed that the North American media is now spending so much time on Europe. Uh, this is a global crisis. Uh, now, with Europe, uh, we have a golden goose. But if we don't feed it quickly, we're going to be in trouble. We have 500 million consumers. And we have an additional 500 million consumers in our partnership regions, Mediterranean, the Gulf, and North Africa. We now have to lay down this third industrial revolution infrastructure, thousands of nodes, so that a billion people can engage equitably in commerce and trade in a continental-wide market so we can have a single space in Europe. Asia is doing it very quickly. Europe either has to do it or it will wither. North America is very far behind. I'm going to tell you, Canada and the U.S. are very far behind what's going on in Europe and Asia. The whole world's in crisis. The question I think every Canadian has to ask, where do you want to be in this country in 20 years from now? Do you want to be in the old energies of the 20th century, tar sands and all those old energies, the old technologies and infrastructure that has no multiplier effect, that's sunsetting? Or do you want to be in the emerging uh, energies of the third industrial revolution, renewable energies, 
the new technologies like energy internets and the new infrastructure for 21st century civilization. If North America, Canada and the U.S. can't find themselves out of the 20th century, if they can't get a door into the 21st, it will happen in Europe, it will happen in Asia, it will happen in South America, and North America may find itself the odd, the odd uh, continent out of this process. What about countries like Venezuela, oil rich? I think that's a curse. Uh, it's, the, it's, the, it's the curse of black, uh, black gold, the oil. Because generally when a country is rich in a single resource, they don't diversify and create the opportunities that will allow them to be able to be versatile against changing conditions. So uh, whether it's uh, Venezuela or countries in the Middle East, show me a country that's simply an oil culture and I'll show you a country that's got real problems. So we have to diversify. Brazil is another good example. They found a lot of offshore oil. But if they only rely on that, uh, then they're doomed in a world market. They have tremendous sun. They have the Amazon. Uh, they have a uh, tremendous amount of water for hydroelectricity. They have wind across the coast. Every country in the world has ample renewable energy, including Canada, to provide all their needs. So why would we pitch ourselves in dirty tar sands, pollute the planet, up the CO2, when Canada has all the green energy it will ever need, not only for its own needs, but for export abroad? And I know this is going to step on toes, and I know people hearing this interview are going to be upset, but people need to hear it. The tar sands is an excuse for the U.S. and Canada not to have to address the issues of climate change and the new economy that has to be forthcoming. It keeps us in an old century that's, that's, way, that's, that's really passing by. Okay, I'm not entering that political quagmire with you. I want to just move on. We have about five minutes left. Uh, the biochemist uh, Joseph Henderson uh, once said, science owes more to the steam engine than the steam engine owes to science. What did he mean by that? What he meant is that um, technology often precedes the science that then explains it. Because, you know, we tinker, we create new technologies, and then we create these more abstract principles to understand it. For example, uh, the laws of thermodynamics that govern energy, they were discovered in the late 19th century because engineers were playing around with machinery and looking at energy flows in machines. So it wasn't until we had steam power and machines that allowed us to then start extrapolating principles, and we came up with the two laws of energy and conservation of energy. So it's quite interesting. Technology tends to put, a, put ourselves ahead of the science that then comes later to explain it. Not okay. always. Take that and apply it to economic thinking. What's happening now is, is we have to have a paradigm shift. Classical Neoclassical economic thinking is wedded in Newtonian physics because when uh, Adam Smith and the early economists penned their theories, uh, Newton's laws of physics were the rage. But it tells you nothing about economics. Newton's physics tells you how fast something's going or where it's located. So Adam Smith and others use that idea of for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction to supply create the idea demand. of supply and demand, et cetera, the invisible hand. It doesn't tell you about economics. Economics is governed by the laws of energy, and that is the laws of thermodynamics, but they weren't discovered until the late 19th century, and by that time no economists wanted to rethink their discipline. But economics is simply how low entropy energy flows in nature, both in resources or in direct energy, are converted by us into goods and services, then they eventually go back to nature, not as useful because we've used a lot of it up. So we tend to think of gross domestic product, for example, as a measure of wealth. John Locke said everything in nature is waste, so you add human labor to it, and you make productive wealth out of it. But actually the laws of thermodynamics tell us the exact opposite. Everything in nature has valuable energy. We convert it, we use it, and eventually it ends up as waste. So GDP, by the new thinking, is not a measure of the wealth you generate. It's your debt to nature. It's the temporary value at the expense of the energy and materials you've used. All of economic theory really has to be rethought as we move into this a third industrial revolution age. In the chapter in the book that I did, which stepped on, stepped on some toes, retiring Adam Smith, some people thought, finally, a breath of fresh air. We really have to think economic theory over again. And how is this going to change how we, how we work? Well, it's going to change the way we work fundamentally because uh, with this new generation, work is going to be more collaborative. Uh, we're going to understand that real power is peer-to-peer -peer in networks. We're going to be able to take more responsibility for the communities in which we live. And we're going to have to see ourselves as part of a human family. That's a completely new economic model. We are not autonomous units. I wrote a book before the Third Industrial Revolution called The Empathic Civilization. 
And what we now realize is that we human beings are the most social creature on the planet. We have the biggest neocortex. We are soft wired in our physiology from birth for empathic sensibility. So if a spider goes up your arm and I see it, I get a creepy feeling as if it's going in my body. Crocodiles don't do that. So we are born as a species to have empathic sensibility and through history, that empathic sen sensitivity has evolved. Forager and hunters were empathic only to their tribal blood ties. As we moved to the great hydraulic civilizations, we became empathic by religious ties. As we went to nation states in the 19th century, we became empathic by national loyalties. So every Canadian thinks of each other as brothers and sisters. Now, as we move to a third industrial revolution, that basic drive of empathic sensibility, we're starting to see ourselves as a species. The young people on Facebook and YouTube and Twitter, they start to think of themselves as part of a human family and begin to empathize with our fellow creatures as part of our evolutionary family. That's a big deal. So I think we're at a cusp where we could envision the possibility of being good neighbors on this planet and actually thinking of ourselves as a human family and empathizing with this planet we live in, but it's a race against time. Can we get there in time? We have the technology. We have an economic plan that makes sense. We are, we are expanding our sensitivities empathically, but we're racing against the clock with climate change and with a global economic crisis. And the question is, can we get up this hill and get over the other side? Speaking of time, we are out of time. Thank you very much for coming in and talking with me. My them. pleasure. Thank you for having me. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.